Hey everyone, today's video we're having a chat with David Trimble who's the organiser of the infamous Red Hook Crit which is a fixed gear criterium. If you've been following this channel for a while you'll know that I've actually raced a few of these and just generally love the event. But in 2019 the race disappeared. So what happened to it? That's what we're going to find out in this video. My mission, what happened to Red Hook Crit, coming up. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm David Trimble. I was the organizer of the famous Red Hook Crit. Back in the day, it was 12 years, 12 years of my life putting on the Red Hook Crit. For those who don't know, I mean, I'm guessing they do if they've clicked on this video, really, but <laughs> could you give us an overview on what Red Hook Crit is, how it got started, what gave you the idea? Red Hook Crit was a, was a bike race that I organized for my 26th birthday in uh, 2008. It was just like a really f like underground, totally unsanctioned, unpermitted event I just did for fun. I think there was 15 people racing at the first one. And what, what made it different than other bike races was it was, a, it was like a traditional urban crit, but on fixed gear bikes and at night. Woo! Woo! Oh my God, she beat him! So it had a lot of like kind of like the alley cat elements to it, but also more of the traditional road cycling elements to it. And the race started out super small, but got bigger every year. Um, by the eleventh year, we you know we had crowds of fifteen, twenty thousand people. We had four hundred athletes from sixty different countries racing, and we had four races in four different countries. So it it went from something very small into something pretty pretty large on the on the cycle in the cycling world. So, what do you think made Red Hook Crit such a global success? What made it such a big hit? Uh, well, I, there was there was kind of different generations of, of the race, and I think something made it successful in, e in each generation. When it started out, it was I think it became successful just because it was like super raw and underground and kind of crazy and dangerous. And then later on, as it got bigger and, and, and more professionally organized, I think the, the community that built the international com community that was built around it became the main main draw where we had. For athletes from all over the world meeting together at these big events and it just it grew this really strong community around it uh, but initially it was it was you know it was a very local community and then it grew to a more international one did you have any idea when you did that first ever race of what it would become no no <laughs> idea no ambitions for it just for fun i actually wanted to organize an alley cap but then i was like oh it's gonna be too much work so i'm gonna do i'm gonna do a really small contained event um, but then every after every race, I was like, "Oh, I, how do I make it better?" Mm. And then, and no matter how small or how inexperienced I was, I always would just like think about ways to make it better. And as the race got bigger, I was I was never quite satisfied with it, so I was always trying mm. to improve it. What was your favorite Red Hook Crit event, and why? Oh man, there's I think there was 29 of them over the years, so I I don't know if there's a, a one event that stood out as a favorite every race like took years out of my life <laughs> felt so mo monumental in a way but you know I think towards the end it started getting a lot more dialed I had a really good team working for me and, and the format was working well and people were just having a lot of fun and I think like yeah probably the 2000 you know the races in 2017 were, were just really really great especially I think Barcelona that year in particular had a really good good energy to it Definitely. So, yeah. Barcelona was definitely my favourite, just purely for the weather and the fact that there's yeah. a nice beach there, which was always a bonus. <laughs> it was always, you know, one of the worst races for us financially. Like, you know, the least amount of spectators. We sold the least amount of merchandise. Um, but the racers, you know, loved it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. The, the energy was always really good. What was the best moment of the Red Hook Crit series, and what was your worst moment? Best moment, like I, like I said, I don't think I could pinpoint just one, but I think just the satisfaction of, I would say, satisfaction of completing each event. Mm. You know, if you just had to, like just that moment of, of the last racer crossing the checkered flag and knowing that you pulled it off was always kind of the best moment. And then going to the after party and seeing how happy everybody was. Because you know, there was always about an hour or so after the race, or maybe, yeah, a little over an hour after every race ended where I would have to, you know, gather my things and then make my way to the party. And I'd always go to the party. It'd always be like already kicked off and everyone just having a great time. So that, that was always a good moment. And 
worst moment, I, I would say, probably just dealing with, with crashes and injuries. And, and, you know, I wouldn't say there's one particular moment that was worse than others, but just mm-hmm. the, the collection of the stress of, of that element, the danger element, was always the worst part of the event for me. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. So coming on to kind of the main focus for this interview, what caused the race to stop? Uh, it was a combination of factors. It had been been going on for so long, and every race was hard to pull off. Um, there's always some kind of existential threat that if something happened, you know, like ten things had to happen perfectly, and if one thing didn't happen, the race wasn't going to um, happen. And, you know, eventually, you're you know, when you're up against those odds, your luck luck's going to run out. And and what what literally happened was, you know, we we had some sponsor issues where we didn't have enough funding to to pull it off in the manner we wanted to. And so I decided to just to take a break and regroup and try to come back stronger. So, you know, the race could have continued in 2019. That was, that was the year we stopped, but it was, it wouldn't have been at the level that it was previously at. So, you know, I, I never, I always said if it started going backwards, I would just take a break from it. I'm just going to quickly interrupt this interview to remind you to like this video if you're enjoying it, it helps this channel a lot, and subscribe for more cycling content. Back to the interview. Yeah, and especially, you know, like you said before, you're trying to improve it every single round. Um, it's difficult if you don't get the budget to do that. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's fundamentally what happened. We did. We could have done one, like, you know, one event or maybe two, two events with less budget than we had before. Um, I always wanted to just, I wanted more budget and, and make the race better and, and bigger and I couldn't do that so I, mm-hmm. I decided to take a break and and I was also, you know, really tired just the decade of, of trying to keep the thing alive so yeah. the elastic the elastic finally snapped and it was time to time to take a break. What sort of cost was it to run the, the whole series and the individual rounds? Well, it started out not costing anything so, you know, for the first, it took took four years to, to get to get a sponsor that paid a single penny um, so initially it really didn't cost anything and then as the race got bigger it kind of the the cost exponentially grew and I think in 2017 I think we we had a budget of like I think we spent about uh, 1.6 million dollars on the whole series and each event was a different, you know, each event cost a different amount, but you had to average out over yes. the whole championship. Where the race in Brooklyn cost double the amount of the race in Milan, but it was a it was a single budget for the whole championship, and the margins were were super thin. Like we would, you know, the race the race in Brooklyn would be like you know four hundred thousand dollars, and we would have four hundred and five thousand dollars of revenue. So. Yeah. So Where we didn't lose money, you know, a lot of bike races lose money and they go into debt and they don't pay their bills. We always at least broke even, but yeah. it was, you know, we didn't, I didn't, I would never go into debt with putting on an event. So it was, it was always razor thin margins. And what made it cost so much money? I mean, that's a lot of cash. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say the biggest expense we had was, was staff. You know, we had a really good team. We had a lot of people working on it. Um, we we brought the same staff to all the events, so there was a lot of travel and lodging, and we hired people that had a lot of experience. And just you know, by the time you have you know forty people on your payroll for an event, you, you know the, those costs add up. And then the venue costs were very high. The security, especially in New York, the security costs were you know hundred thousand dollars or something just just to have the police there to you know do nothing and hang out by the food trucks. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, in, it sounds like a lot of money, but if you compare it to other professional events, it's really actually a pretty shoestring budget. Got you. Um, just by the, by the time you're bringing that many people into a venue and, and running, you know, that kind of operation with, with those, that kind of safety risk and, and crowd control, it, it just, it just adds up. I mean, you've kind of answered the next question in there, but was it too big to sustain financially? Uh, I don't. I don't think it was too big because I think I think the value of the event was even more than the money we were bringing in. I think, and you know, there's a, there's events that have a fraction of the exposure we have that cost way more. They just you know happen to have somebody you know willing to pay for it. So yeah. I think it's just 
as the world turns, you know, sometimes you find people to fund your, fund your things and sometimes you don't. And, you know, we're, we ran into a period where we didn't have the funding, but I don't think it necessarily got t- to be too big. If anything, I think our budget was, was too small, like in order to, to make it to the next step, which would have been live streaming and broadcast and, and more events, we needed a lot more money, like you know, yeah. triple or five times the amount of money. But maybe then it would have become more sustainable if we had more money. Got because you. Then, our, then, then we, would have, we, would, we would have attracted bigger sponsors. Yeah, so what, what are the sponsors who get involved with Red Hook Crit? What are they kind of looking for when they, when they partner up? I think initially, like the, the cycling brands, they really liked how creative it was and how we, we reached this alternate cycling um, atmosphere and how we reached people inside cities, like people that would never go to a bike race, went to the Red Hook Crit. And mm. So the cycling brands got a lot of exposure out of that. Um, and then I think that's also the reason we attracted some, some big non-cycling sponsors like Rockstar Games. They just loved the fact that we could get you know, 20,000 people out to, you know, out to the Red Hook in Brooklyn and all these people were, were exposed to their brand. Mm. Um, but it, I think where, where we failed was we, we couldn't get these really big sponsors that just wanted like mass brand exposure where, you know, if you have a million people watching it on TV, all they, all they see is a logo and not, not something creative. Would you do anything differently, do you think? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Probably at every event, I would have done something differently. I think uh, fundamentally, I, I think I, my approach worked. You know, I didn't. I never like compromise on the original spirit of the event, and I always like if I was in a dispute with a sponsor and they wanted me to change something that I didn't agree with, I'd always like fight tooth, like tooth and nail to to hold on to what I thought was right for the event. And I, I probably lost a couple sponsors that way. And you know, maybe I could have gotten other sponsors had I changed things or had a different approach. But I think overall, that's what let let the race grow to be so big, but also keep its original spirit. So I don't I don't think I would have changed the the general approach. I, I was super inexperienced when I started it, so I didn't know anything about organizing anything. So you know, if I had had more experience going into it, maybe maybe you know could have could have developed faster or or in a smarter way. Do you think the sponsorship model of cycling is broken? <laughs> um, I guess what depends, cause, you know, cycling is such a big, big sport, and you know, between pro cycling and amateur events, and you know, I, I would say the the lack of money definitely is is a huge challenge for cycling, and the lack of like unity between the different cycling uh, niches and. And if you look at how much money cycling has compared to other sports, it just doesn't have anything. I would say that is, I, I would maybe not call it broken, but it's never been developed properly, in my opinion. Where It's such an old traditional sport, and, and kind of the, the main events in cycling only exist because they're really old and traditional, and they have such a weird you know, way to, ex- you know, Tour de France, like you couldn't design that event now. It'd be impossible. It only exists because it's been going on for so long. And it's so powerful in the sport of cycling. It moves so much of the money that it's really hard for for other parts of the of the sport to develop. So in that sense, I guess it, it could be considered a little bit broken. Um, have you got any ways that you would improve it? <laughs> I mean, yeah. If someone were to give me millions of dollars, I would definitely improve it. And I think <laughs> I think cycling has huge potential. And it's, it's, I think the right hook could prove that if you do it in a in a in a way that's extremely accessible to to people that aren't like traditionalists, it can become a, a huge spectator sport and be really exciting uh, television product. And it can exist in big cities, not just in the countryside. Uh, it could be more of like a you know Formula One or or MotoGP or or something like that. It can really um, have a have a big impact, but it needs it needs the right amount of funding and the right vision. Mm-hmm. And I think like the people that come in with a lot of money they always come in with the wrong approach and they kind of burn through it. You know, the, the billionaires who start pro cycling teams, and, you know, they don't, they don't try to re reimagine what cycling can be. And I think the Red Hood crit did that. We just didn't get over the hump of, of the, our funding problem. Will Red Hood crit ever make a return? Hopefully I'm still, uh, <laughs> I, I still have ambitions for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, I think, 
I think it would come back easily and still be strong. Like, you know, some parts of it would have to be rebuilt, but, you know, it's such a fun event that I think you could do it. It's a timeless, fun event, and I think people would come out, you know, would really be driven to compete in it again, and spectators would love to see it come back. So, yeah, I think it'll, I think it'll come back in the future. If it was to come back, so hypothetically, would you try and replicate a four series format, or would you go all guns blazing, massive series, multiple continents? Um, I mean, ideally, we would we would start we would pick up where we left off with like a four four race series. Um, you know, initially I said, oh, I'm only doing it again if I can come back. You know, with the equal strength of when we left off. But since since COVID and everything, I've kind of softened that approach where. Even if I could just do one or two events, I think I would, mm-hmm. I would still be interested in it. You know, I think it still has value. So, but uh, ideally, ideally, we'd come back as a as a series. Yes. So, if you're watching and you've got two million quid spare, now you know what, what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think making a, a more European centered championship makes sense. Like it, putting on races in the United States is just incredibly difficult compared to Europe. Mm-hmm. So I, I could see in the future where it's, you know, maybe there's not even a race in North America, but it's more uh, more events, but but centered in Europe. Interesting. So just to round out this interview, um, I want to ask you what you are up to at the moment and what's next? <laughs> uh, you know, I think like a lot of event organizers, I'm a, a bit on standby right now with, with COVID. Uh, luckily, I've kept myself busy riding a lot of bikes, especially mountain bikes. So it's actually been nice to take a break. Uh, it's, and it's helping me get a lot of energy for the future when, when events can come back. I, w- I was super busy right up in, you know, during 2019, there was no Red Hook. But I was really busy working on other events. I worked on, on the six day series. I worked on Formula E. I worked on some running events. And I actually learned a lot that I could apply to Red Hook. Um, and then and then when COVID really hit, everything just stopped. So, kind of kind of in a holding pattern right now. Yeah, it's a crazy time for all of us, especially those who are involved in events. But fingers crossed, <laughs> fingers and toes yeah. crossed for next year. Yeah, and I've no, I have zero interest in like doing virtual events. So. Yeah. Whenever whenever I come back, it's going to be with a real event with with a lot of people gathering. So. <laughs> so just just being patient right now. So what's next for the sport of fixed gear racing? Uh, I guess it's going to depend how things things shake out with you know with COVID and when events come back. But I think when things can come back full strength, there's going to be so much energy for it. Uh, I think mm. you know I think people are going to do stuff again for passion, not just money. You know, not just professional uh, opportunities. I think people are just going to be really energetic to make special things happen. I think that's one thing people realize how important community is and getting together and, and how important building culture is. Cause when it's stripped away, your life gets pretty boring and you just like, if you just focus on work and zoom calls and <laughs> virtual stuff, it just, it's just boring. So there's a lot of, a uh, lot of value for events that maybe don't make investors a lot of money or, you know, but they make people happy. So I think people are going to have a lot of energy for that. As someone who's taken part in the Red Hook Crit, you know, that community atmosphere, it's almost like a bit of a traveling circus, international family. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people are missing that and would love to see it return. And hopefully, you know, maybe some of them will see this video and it'll hopefully give them a bit of hope that Red Hook Crit will be back in the future. Yeah, it'll, it'll be back. So. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me on this interview. Great. Thanks for having me. Hopefully this interview has helped answer some of those burning Red Hook Crit questions. And if it hasn't, be sure to leave your questions down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the interview, be sure to hit the like button. It helps the channel a lot. Subscribe for more cycling content. I bring out videos every single Friday. So yeah, come join the family. All right. See you in the next video. Bye.